Pilot sending out Atlanta. Atlanta's in the water. Copy that. This is an audio slate for dive H2006, expedition NA154. UTC time is 07-23-30. Hey Robert, are you ready for me to hit that dive salvo? Welcome to the 8 to 12 show, baby. We just got inked. Starting off with a little bit of ink there. Getting inky. Yeah, we did see some squid, uh, at least one squid, uh, while we were preparing to launch Herc for uh, running up to the control van. So, uh, very inky evening to everybody. It's the 8 to 12 watch on uh, Expedition NA-154 aboard the EV Nautilus. Happy to have everybody back again in the van and all of you listening in, in online, our fellow deep sea travelers. Mm -hmm. Control van, we are all stopped on the winch at 50. Are you ready to receive controls? We are ready. Yeah, you should have control.
Audio check for SPL. Getting quite a show from the uh, squid this evening. We saw some before Herc was launched, and uh, you know, we've been inked at least twice now. Kanaloa just letting us know he's here. Yeah. yeah it's been a beautiful day out in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Very busy day, too. Got a lot of mapping done today. Yep. Yeah, we have uh, some beautiful uh, beautiful boobies on the bow. Saw the moon come out. Mahina, mm. the, the moon phase tonight? Kulua. 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 Yeah. OK. Beautiful crescent moon. Beautiful, yeah. It comes up early, and it just hovers. And before coming into the control van, it looks like a golden yellow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But so nice. I a little bit, head. a little bit backlit, so you can just barely see the dark side. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely beautiful. Yeah, watched it reveal itself as the sun went down. Mm -hmm. So already quite low in the sky. We'll set early as well, mm -hmm. but uh, such a gift to catch a glimpse. We are on our way down to just under 2,500 meters on another unnamed, soon to be given a beautiful name, I hope, mm -hmm. uh, underwater seamount. Uh, I guess sea all seamounts are underwater. Seamount number 12. Seamount number 12. Yep. Seamount number 12. So we've been on 17, 11, and now 12. Uh, part of this seamount was, was mapped um, back by research vessel Kilo Moana. Um, this is the research vessel of the University of Hawaii back in 2015, and and we worked to uh, get a little bit more mapping done earlier today, making a few passes over the seamount as we went. Similar to our last couple of dives, we'll be um, looking for some geological samples, help Dr. Val and other geologists um, Try to try to characterize this this ancient sea mountain volcano. Understand how old it is, um, which plumes it was mantle plumes it was associated with. Mm -hmm. I may need some corrections on some of this information. I'm still learning, but uh, oh no, you're doing great. And uh, also, of course, uh, we've been incredibly just given an, a marvelous show um, by Papa Hanamukuakea and Kanaloa, um, the Pacific Ocean Moana Nui Akea delivering big time with. Uh, inviting us into some of the rich biological, ecological communities that we've seen on the seafloor and these seamounts here. So uh, almost starting to expect it, but going to go in knowing that uh, it's a gift. Whatever we get to see is a gift. This is uh, Daniel Kinzer. I'm science communication fellow. I call Honolulu, Hawaii on the island of Oahu home. And it's great to be with everybody tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um I guess I'll take this moment to uh, introduce myself as well. Uh, just go down the line here. Uh, I'm Val Finlayson, I'm a uh, postdoc at uh, University of Maryland, a geologist, and I do a lot of isotope geochemistry on seamounts just like this one, and probably including this one in, uh, 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 s at some future point. Um, not sure when, given how many samples I'm working on in the lab at the moment, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, trying to trace mantle plumes and uh, their hotspot tracks across the seafloor. Try to learn a little bit more about how this planet works. Because in some ways, we know a little bit more about the Hubble deep field than we do what's under the crust of our own planet. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping to eventually help answer some of those questions a little better. Love it. Thanks, Dr. Val. Over to you, Virginia. 
Awesome. Hi all, um, I'm Virginia. I am a um, ecologist, a deep sea ecologist, currently working on um, seamounts on the Northwest Hawaii Island and um, Emperor Seamount Ridge, um, Emperor Seamount Chain, sorry. Um, I've had the privilege of working in the Papahānaumokuākea Marine National Monument, um, and I feel so privileged to be working here again. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to see what this seamount has in store. Thanks, Virginia. Our light down at the end of the line. Mahalo nui, Dan. Aloha mai kako. Um, Ovo Kukui, no Moio. Aloha everybody, my name is uh, Kukui Gavigan. I'm from the island of Maui and I am one of the data loggers on board and I am so blessed and humbled and grateful as always to be here with um, such amazing people both on board and on shore in this very special place, Papahano Mokuakea. So, mahalo nui. Mahalo kukui and we have a beautiful Mahina Lani outside setting in Komohana in the west but we also have one in here in the back row. You know, want to introduce yourself? <laughs> of course. Mahalo nui, Daniel. Um, aloha ahi ahi kako, mehna leni kavaleri ko ui noa, no o ahu me au. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Mahina Lenny Cavallari. I'm from the island of Oahu, uh, first time sailing on board Nautilus. And I do have a little information about our Po Mahina, our moon phase tonight, I'd like to share um, as we all just kind of witness the uh, Kulua moon. Kua mehina na omakua ho'o lau pa'i. Ina kanaka apau. Ku and hina are the ancestral gods that enable mankind to flourish. And the Kamea no Uhane, the spiritual significance of the Kulua. It is the fourth day of the old Hawaiian calendar and the name of the second ku moon that appears during the initial ho'onui or anahulu waxing phases of the lunar moon. It is associated with the element of air, air and eleku, northern direction. Kulua literally translates in the English language as a pairing off as of mates or twins. Um, what is this? In ancient times, kahikina kala avelona o kala, the rising and the setting of the sun, not only designated the heavenly boundaries of the Hawaii Islands archipelago or Paiaina, um, it also represented the early Hawaiians' astral ancestral connection to the divine sources of their spiritual and terrestrial worlds. Amazing. Mahalo. Thank you. Mahalo mahina. Kulua. Mahina kulua. Yeah. We're seeing a lot of squid uh, on this descent. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing a lot of birds today. Very busy hunting all around the ship all day, and I'm mm -hmm. wondering if uh, I'm wondering if they were interested in the squid. The seamount must be uh, must be productive. Yeah, it's uh, feeding so. all of us up here at the surface, all of our bird family friends, and our and uh, squid coming up uh, towards our light this evening. And um, I'm hoping that's a good sign for what's below, more life below on the seamount. Yeah, one hopes. Yeah, we're not sure what to expect from this one. It's a little bit of a different shape, the seamount, compared to yeah. the last two. So two dives ago, um, we were on a guillo, which is a uh, seamount with a flat top and very steep sides. Uh, the last dive was on a seamount that um, pretty much looked like a series of interconnected ridges, uh, no flat top, and uh, actually an interesting false uh, summit, you know, a false high with an actual high further up along uh, the uh, the, uh, one of the central ridges. Uh, today, uh, the seamount that we mapped and plan to dive along um, doesn't have any uh, very distinct, very sharp ridges. It has a few, uh, a few ridge features uh, that are a little bit shallower, a little bit flatter. Um, and it's a much more conically shaped seamount with uh, no flat top. So it, it looks, it has that kind of cone shape like uh, what you might expect of a, uh, a fairly typical volcano on land. I was going to say, it kind of reminds me of some of our Maui Island. Oh, what is this? Island. Those kinophores, or is Ooh. that something else? I think this might be squid ink. They're still getting us, huh? 
<laughs> this is active water column. This is pretty exciting. Our yeah. our descent already putting on a show. We're still well above the top of the seamount, over a thousand meters uh, above the summit of of the beautiful Mauna Kea that Val was uh, just describing. We also had a question come in about the details about the connection between mapping and selecting a dive site. Um, Val and also our mapper and navigator Catalino and when she's able might be able to share more but uh, we love uh, we love diving on these seamounts because they they typically host such a range of, of interesting biological communities they provide hard substrate and of course some of that hard substrate is super interesting for our geologists as well we love those rocks so um, when we when we find and map those uh, in fairly high resolution um, these seamounts uh, we're able to sort of set a path um, that Hercules and Atalanta can follow um, kind of on their own little climb um, up parts of this mountain. So we get to be in different depths, uh, different topographies, um, different substrate characteristics, and then we often find kind of a diversity of biological communities. So there's just a lot to learn here. Mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, that's my story. But yeah, Dr. Val, you're, you're part of uh, the dive planning team and what are some of the, based on what we map, what are some of the connections between that and how you plan out a dive? Yeah, um, that, that was an excellent summary. Um, what we what we end up looking for when we map are um, uh, structural features like uh, uh, these these uh, volcanic ridges, uh, because often uh, those are places where we find uh, uh, the the most dense uh, biological communities because they're. Uh, they're seated up into the water column, yet they still have some firm substrate, uh, hard substrate that they uh, like to, to attach to. So they're a lot like me. They, they like the hard substrate. Um, it's, it's, it's good for them. And uh, awesome. uh, it, it also provides us uh, kind, kind of the best all around uh, uh, survey. So we can, we can take care of uh, multiple science and survey goals along these ridges. And uh, um, so we're, we're kind of uh, uh, achieving several goals all at once, which is great. It's it's wonderfully efficient science and um, uh, minimizes the amount of impact that we have on the seamount as well. Um, so uh, a lot of the seafloor is not mapped. Um, what we know about the seafloor is from uh, you know the original um, sonar work by. Uh, uh, just some heroic efforts by uh, some folks in the uh, 40s, 50s, 60s uh, over at uh, Lamont Doherty Earth, uh, Earth Observatory. Uh, Marie Tharp and Bruce Heason, they, uh, uh, folks who uh, developed the first physiographic maps of the uh, ocean basins and revealed that they're not entirely these boring, featureless expanses. In fact, it's they're, they're mountains, volcanoes, all over the ocean. So many volcanoes. Thousands. And um, those maps have been improved on over time, but um, one of the base maps that we use for a lot of this nowadays is uh, uh, a um, shuttle gravimetry uh, data set. So this is gravimetry measured by the space shuttles. Um, and uh, that's a, uh, you can use uh, gravity as a uh, predictor of uh, 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 what certain uh, landforms may look like that we're, that we're not necessarily able to see because uh, you can get these tiny little fluctuations in, a, in a, uh, the measurement of the gravity in a certain spot based on what kind of mass is, is present in that spot. So if there's a, uh, so if there's a mountain uh, somewhere on the seafloor that we can't see because it's under an entire ocean, uh, that's a little bit of extra mass, and we can measure with very sensitive instrumentation these tiny little fluctuations in gravity that that mountain will have. And uh, that will register as um, you know, basically a gravity high, which indicates a, a potential seafloor, uh, seafloor feature. So we have this predictive bathymetry map of the seafloor that gives us uh, some of the initial information about where certain features like seamounts uh, or rift zones, or oceanic plateaus, or subduction zones uh, might be. And we go and we ground truth these by doing high resolution uh, bathymetric surveys with uh, modern uh, uh, multi-beam uh, sonar systems that lets us map these at high resolution. And uh, gravity can't give us the, uh, the really fine details 
that we need in order to uh, plan out a survey like this along a ridge. So we go out and we uh, we map and we fill in. We try to fill in as many of these gaps uh, in the, uh, uh, the bathymetric surveys that we can. And, uh, you know, we pick our targets based on either older mapping data, that lower resolution, or you know, this predicted gra uh, gra uh, gravimetric data set. And uh, we we generate this map in real time on the ship. And uh, after a few hours, uh, kind of making several passes back and forth uh, in order to entirely map the seamount, we end up uh, with a fair amount of detail about what it looks like. And that lets us uh, help plan out a route. Yeah, a beautiful 3D map with a, <coughs> with a beautiful path. <coughs> yeah. Excuse me, marked out for, uh, for our ROV pilots and our navigators to, uh, to help us follow yeah. on this journey. They'll, they'll set up waypoints. Uh, that once we acquire the bottom, uh, that'll take us uh, up the path that they're able to to put on the maps, the 3D maps in, in mm -hmm. high resolution. And of course, you can't see every detail of every feature, but um, get a pretty good idea of how quickly we're going to be climbing as we most often, from what I understand, move from the deepest point on the dive up towards the shallower. We've been trying to acquire the summit or at least the top of the guillos on past dives when we were di diving on the guillos. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that was outstanding. Thanks, yeah. Dr. Val. You're welcome. Yeah, and we have a very talented team of uh, navigators and mappers. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we have a whole software suite and, com and uh, uh, data lab on the ship where we can uh, process these in nearly real time and uh, rapidly produce um, uh, these, these map data sets. Yeah, so we do. We're we're doing basically, you know, two things. Uh, when when we're not uh, when we're not diving on a seamount, we're uh, we're usually mapping, uh, be it uh, in transit to our next location or mapping over our target location. Speaking so. of what some have called the the greatest uh, the greatest mapping navigator team member, the greatest watch of all time, <laughs> Catalina, you want us to kick off the front row and introduce uh, introduce yourselves to the internets. Sure. Well, thank you. That was very kind. Um, my name is Catalina, and I'm a master's student at the University of South Florida's College of Marine Science. And I am serving here as a first-time navigator, helping out the ROV team navigate their way around. Mahalo, Catalina. Over to uh, over to Aquaman on the Herc pilot seat. Aquaman. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'm uh, Robert Waters. I'm sitting in the Herc seat. I'm uh, OET employee. I'm facilities manager and ROV engineer at our facility in San Pedro, California. Big big shout out to Robert and and Zach, who you meet in a minute, and the whole ROV team and deck team for uh, for on the fly doing some fixes out here in the field. Uh, while we were mapping to make sure that we could dive um, as soon as possible. And I know that was hard work, hot work, and uh, really appreciate you guys for Mahalo, doing that. Mahalo, you guys. Awesome. We kind of avoided it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, eh, still earned a cookie in my book. <laughs> there you go. Zach? Um, Zach Gonzalez, Atlanta pilot, Roberts, Minion. <laughs> there you go. Um, been doing RV for a few years, and I'm just happy to be here. We're happy you're here too, Zach. Thank you. Hi, I'm Amber, uh, the uh, video engineer, and I first came on board Nautilus uh, as an intern back in 2016. I've been back a few times, and this year back as a lead and it's been just a, um, an amazing experience so far so happy to be here as well thank you it's a pleasure to uh, have you on the greatest watch team of all time 8 to 12 I know the world is glad we're back on to uh, take you down into the depths with us we still have a couple thousand meters to go um, over a mile um, left before we acquire this seamount, but uh, th those pilots and video engineers and navigators just bringing us all incredible views of, of the deep sea, taking us into the realm of Kanaloa and safely back again. And yeah, I can't wait to see what we learn today.
This is, uh, what is this? Is the eighth dive now? Uh, seventh? seventh dive? I'm losing track. I oh. know, yeah. <laughs> seventh dive of, no, eighth. I, I'm having trouble keeping track of it because we did reconfigure it. We did at one two point, and so. then three and then two. That's seven. And then this is the eighth. Yeah. I'm, hey, look, uh, we can count. I can count. <laughs> <laughs> that's my contribution. Some days uh, to that's, the that's really hard. <laughs> knowledge set in the room. But uh, eighth dive of the Ala Amwana Kaiuli expedition, um, as Val said earlier, NA 154. An incredible expedition season that's been taking place. Uh, but I have to say, I think. Uh, I think we lucked out, team. This was this has been one of the greatest uh, expeditions. I could have, I could never have even hoped for this. I had no idea yeah. it could be this spectacular. So, and doing it with all of you has made it even more spectacular. So, it's, it's a wonderful crew. It's a very happy ship. <laughs> it is, and it's not easy. Not easy living at sea for so long. We, we've done uh, eight. This is our eighth dive, and uh, we're over two weeks at sea. We still have another. Um, at least 10 days, maybe 11 days left before we'll arrive um, back home for me in Honolulu uh, at port in, on Oahu in the Hawaiian Islands. Many of our teammates will have to travel back home after that. But yeah, just uh, it's an incredibly long expedition, um, but it's, uh, it's just remarkable. So. Yeah, so much has been revealed. The ocean was so malie today and saw a bunch of manukai. Um, Oh, all sorts of ocean birds. I saw an Eva diving. Oh, Eva bird yeah, today. earlier oh. amongst like the boobies. Um, oh. They're all cruising and diving and hunting malolo, um, flying fish this morning. Oh wow! Yeah. Awesome. So, and today was you know it was a good productive day for everyone. Our ROV team was working really hard. Um, we were in transit to our our current dive location, um, and they were able to really get everything prepared, all of the equipment ready for this current dive that we're on now. Um, so 24 hour operations from everyone on board still. Our lovely uh, ship's crew keeping everything going and on board Nautilus. We have our ROV team making sure all of our equipment is ready for our next dives. Um, just still a lot happening even on Sunday and then treated with ice cream ice cream sundae <laughs> that's why we're so happy i know yeah so we happy. all got our sugar fix Ooh. yeah <laughs> that light is quite light oh, yeah oh, yeah wow. <laughs> we deserve it <laughs> hey buddy we love you even if you're attacking us yeah. <laughs> hey this isn't our house <laughs> Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. is that him in the back yeah, if Herc came just, you know, dropping into my house, I might put up a little bit of a fight, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, there he goes again. And yes, the lychee ice cream is so good. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. <laughs> it was also a rock o'clock this morning. I, oh, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Mahalo, hit. Dr. Yeah. Bell, for no hosting us. Yeah. I got rocks on the brain all the time, so. Yeah. <laughs> It's great to see so many members of the team out uh, helping process some of our recent geological samples. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Speaking of speaking of those samples, Dr. Vell, anything upon site upon bringing those back up to the surface that's kind of been revealed about these last two seamounts before we get a chance to more further process or analyze them? Uh, so I haven't been able to uh, cut open the um, uh, the last dives rocks quite yet. Uh, just a lack of time today. It was, yeah. uh, we were pretty busy uh, cutting and describing up the uh, uh, the ones from uh, two dives ago. Um, so those, yeah, we got we got some cool stuff. Um, I think we got a uh, looks like a couple of pieces of uh, uh, some of the dikes that were intruding that we saw along portions of that dive along that very steep cliff face. Right. Um, yeah, those uh, didn't have a lot of bubbles in them from uh, gases. Usually we see the uh, uh, vesicles are a pretty common thing that we see in volcanic rocks, even in ones that were erupted deep underwater. And really not a lot in uh, a lot of acidulation to see in that. Um, we got our, the first sample we picked up on 2004 is uh, actually a uh, somewhat less common type of hyaloclastite um, that we see every now and again. Um, so normally the ones that we see are uh, those, those yellowish rocks uh, that we've pointed out here and there on some of these dives. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's not often a, a lot that we can do with them scientifically, unfortunately, uh, at least not for uh, like a, 
you know, tracing mantle sources and seamount origins and things like that, because they're, they're just so altered that they're really difficult to work with uh, in the lab. Um, this this other kind of like subcategory that's a little unusual actually um, are, can be really useful. They're still extremely altered, uh, you know, same formation process, but uh, these hyaloclastites are always like a different color. They're not that yellow color, they're like a red brown to like kind of like this black yellow, sort of hard to describe color. So different color, but they also have uh, minerals in them. Oh. So it's it Those comes from crystals? yeah, it comes from a crystal rich uh, magmatic source. And we get these sometimes giant clinopyroxene crystals in these. And often those are, um, despite, you know, the rest of the rock being really highly altered, most of them, uh, most of the clinopyroxenes are really, really fresh. You know, uh, clinopyroxene tends to resist uh, alteration pretty well over long periods of time. Eventually it does alter, and we, we definitely see that in some of the rocks. But uh, here you can get these fresh ones. You can do geochronology with them. Uh, you can uh, easily get enough uh, enough of these to do um, other kinds of isotope work on oh, them, besides just geochronology. So we can use uh, sometimes just the clinopyroxene uh, separated out of this rock to get that isotopic fingerprint that we're after to try to determine the ages and the origins of these seamounts. So um, yeah, I was I was really excited to see that when we cut this open this morning. That's amazing. Also, That's they look exciting. cool. Yeah, I bet. Oh, I <laughs> they look pretty cool. All right. I'll have to show you later. <laughs> yeah, I want to come see. Cl yeah, clinopyroxene. Yeah. Clinopyroxene crystals, everybody. Say it with me. Clinopyroxene. We're, <laughs> we're learning new rock terms, geological <laughs> terms all the time. We're, we're trying our best yeah. uh, to keep up with Val and, and when it's biological in nature, keep up with Virginia. Um, but uh, not always easy, but we're always learning. We hope you're learning with us at home. We appreciate your stories, your questions, your comments online. So keep those coming in. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one other thing we saw that was interesting with this, not so thick manganese crusts. Oh, I don't know what that means yet, but they only Ooh. maxed out around half a centimeter thick. Um, that can mean potentially two things. One, either that that's a somewhat younger seamount than some of the others we've visited around here, uh, or two, um, the seamount formed, and then that collapse happened some, you know, maybe tens of millions of years later, and then uh, things got coated with manganese crust along From that uh, along that cliff face, uh, you know, later. So, I, I, this unfortunately, is I, yeah. It's this is the big question, right? Is there, we're getting closer to this Hawaiian ridge? Yeah. Um, where the Hawaiian hotspot would have passed under, that plume would have passed under, and we just don't know. Are these uh, seamounts associated with that mantle plume or, or with per perhaps an older one? And so this is exactly the kind of, this is the data we need to help us understand these questions. Yeah, and unfortunately it's it's uh, not a definitive answer, but um, <laughs> it gives us at least some idea about the timing of uh, the formation of the manganese crusts on these rocks, and it was a little bit you know, it, it looks like there was a little bit less time there. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, you know, is, is that actually representative of the seamount age or a process that later affected the seamount? And that's not a question we can answer at this point. You know, Absolutely. it's just way too early. You know, we're only just learning. You know, I don't know much uh, about geology and the study of rocks. I'm, I'm learning a lot. But one thing that I am, am under coming to understand is that you know, rocks reveal their secrets in layers. They don't tell the whole story all at once. You really have to, you know, see, give, a look at them visually. Then you have to feel them. Then you have to cut them open, start to analyze the encrusting layers, and then we have to put them through this really amazing process that through the mass spectrometers, breaking them down and looking at some of their their isotopic signatures, and and that this puzzle comes to us in layers. And I just I mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I think it's. Uh, it's appropriate considering we're telling stories or, or having stories revealed to us that are sometimes uh, tens, hundreds of millions of years old. So Yeah, yeah. pretty grandiose stories. You know, awesome. This is the story of the Pacific, the story of the interior of the Earth and how it works. Wow. Yeah, it's planet making, it's yeah. Earth making, it's ocean making. It's really, really mm -hmm. incredible. And it's the Hawaiian story, this Hawaiian hotspot mm -hmm. and ridge that, that Pele has traveled down, continues to travel down, is... Uh, has been known by by the Hawaiian ancestors for a long time, still known and felt today, and and that's part of what makes these waters so sacred. 
to the Hawaiian community. So it's that, you know, the story weaves, but, you know, the rocks hold so many secrets um, mm -hmm. and so much mana, so much energy, so much spirit that, that goes back into the deepest parts of our, our past in Hawaii. So really, really special to be able to touch them. I know when the samples came up yesterday, I was able to just kind of shower myself in some of the salt water that came up with Hercules and knowing that most of that salt water had just come from the surface but still felt cool. Some of it might have been trapped in Hercules as it moved mm -hmm. up. And the water in the bio yeah. box is going to be quite cold. Yeah. So I'm sure some of it is still sticking around from the deep sea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I know the waters aren't that cold at the surface. Yeah, I loved it. It was a uh, beautiful, you know, beautiful experience. Uh, we don't as much as I would like to, we don't get to do any swimming out here. It's, it's mm -hmm. almost the hardest part for me in some ways, spending four weeks at sea and not, not being allowed to jump in. So touch the ocean. Mm -hmm. They've yeah. had to pull me pull me back from the edge a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely it's all around us. We see it every moment, <laughs> every waking moment, even in our sleep, we see the ocean in around us. It's true. Yeah. But we're not allowed to immerse ourselves in it until we get back to our shores. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, one day. Yeah. One day, like everyone, we'll swim through these waters and get to know what it feels like to be fully immersed. But mm -hmm. hopefully, that's a ways off for all of us too. Very much so. That's uh, something that, if you're a member of the uh, Alvin team, you need to go swimming all the time. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Nice. That's one of the jobs. Is uh, yeah. There's two people for every launch and recovery. Help recover that, and that launch the vehicle. Have to go out and jump in the water. Hey, are you sometimes a swimmer, Bob, or only, Robert, uh, or only yeah, a pilot? You got to do that to qualify as an Alvin person, but I don't do it anymore. <laughs> 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 I gave that up. Yeah, they trust you. <laughs> I think my favorite part about watching those guys is when they would be riding on top and at some point they would pull out a phone from inside, yeah. like a landline, <laughs> and they were just talking to the bridge, but I like to picture they were like talking back home, like, hey guys, that's what's awesome. That? <laughs> yeah, you gotta, the swimmer's got to talk to the, the submarine pilot to know what's going on. So like literally they're standing on Alvin like they're riding a sandworm from Dune and then they're just <laughs> yeah. on the phone. I have a picture, I'll show you. That's, that's amazing. Cool. Like, this is in my head and it's just blowing my Too mind right fun. now. <laughs> <laughs> Ocean exploration is pretty wacky, everybody. If, uh, this <laughs> is just an amazing, amazing thing that we get to do, and I'm so glad we get to bring it to you all. Hey, it's adapting our technology in novel ways to do some of this extreme science. Yeah, that's so right. it's going gonna, it's gonna to seem a little bit, like, surprising. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. When you're, when you're uh, just kind of learning about things like that. I might do it that again. Awesome. Oh my I, gosh. I, I might awesome. go out again next year. <laughs> Catalina's showing us an image of that. <laughs> I need to. <laughs> All right, I'm ready, Robert. How, can I, how do I sign up to be a swimmer <laughs> for Alvin? So actually, yeah, crew members can, can be swimmers as well. You don't just have to be a member of the Alvin team. The crew members on the ship on the Atlantis also go out as swimmers. The data loggers and things. All right. Yeah. There you go, Kukui. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> All right. We're coming so one, up. one thing I can tell you about the rocks from 2005 or our last dive, um, we can see through the crust a little bit. They're all vesiculated, so yeah, we know they're vesicular news. basalts. Yeah. I just can't see the insides yet. They came from the volcano, came out of the mantle mm -hmm. in that plume, and so when you are able to analyze those, we're going to get some great information. Yeah, stay tuned. Rocks. It's not fast work, but, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, sometimes, sometimes quality work doesn't come quickly. Yeah, that's and, true. Uh, yeah. Almost always true. Yeah, sometimes the work has to take several months, otherwise it doesn't work. <laughs> Dr. Vell, like where's, the, where, where's the best place to go for someone who wants to follow, um, you know, geological discoveries or, you know, but, but is maybe not going to dig into the journals, not going to really spend the time studying it from mm. an academic perspective, but, but just wants to, is there, is there a favorite magazine, is there a favorite website? Is there a place that you would send people who are like, yeah, I'm a real big fan of geology. I want to learn more, but maybe don't have, 
you know, the time or constitution or desire to, uh, you know, to read through places where some of this knowledge is going to be presented in, in various publications and, and papers and at, at certain conferences. You know, where else could we go? That's a really good question. Um, there, there are a few places. So um, USGS.gov, um, the U.S. Geological Survey, has a lot of really good outreach and education materials on their website, as awesome. well as a lot of really technical stuff, and that's all open access. That's great. Um, let's see, there's a... Uh, uh, there is IRIS, which does a lot of work with uh, earthquakes. Mm -hmm. um, hang on, let me look that up. And then I'm misspelling that because that's nice. Uh, Sounds like we might need to create it's rockoclock.com or something like that. Oh we my might, gosh. This I don't might have, be a. I don't even have time gap. to maintain my personal website. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. We can do it. I don't think this is quite it, but yeah, um, yeah. There, there's a, you know, I'll, I'll have to see if we can compile some resources maybe on the Nautilus Live website somewhere. Oh, but that's a um, great idea. yeah, there's this whole Earthscope consortium too, which uh, does a lot of, uh, uh, which, uh, does a lot of science uh, around the U.S. and um, in a bunch of other places as well. And they've been uh, one of the things that they've done in the last decade or so that's been really fruitful is uh, something called the uh, what is it? Movable array, something like that. Mm -hmm. I, I probably have the name wrong, but they what they did was uh, for a long time uh, set up a pretty dense mobile network of um, uh, seismometers, and they they deployed them in sectors across the U.S. over a period of time, uh, and that way we could get some really uh, high resolution seismic information to learn about um, uh, uh, the structure of the continent beneath our feet. Wow. And uh, yeah, it's. Um, I think they've been deploying that in some other areas, but I haven't kept up on it in a while. So um, yeah, Earthscope uh, consortium websites are always good. Um, as far as like press releases about research, though, like like you know, kind of learning about um, uh, some of the latest studies and stuff that have come out. That's that's um, a little bit more spread out. So. Um, I have a couple of friends who will write stuff on commission for like uh, the Atlantic or uh, oh, National fun. Geographic. Sure. Um, you know, some, uh, and they'll kind of freelance around sometimes like New York Times, yeah. things like that. So it's, um, I don't know, there's not really one like centralized place um, that I really go to for um, like geology stuff. Yeah. Sounds like Isotope Stories might ne might need to be a magazine, not just a one oh release. <laughs> a subscription. <laughs> a subscription, yeah. I hey. can only do so many things. Oh. <laughs> I already do too much. <laughs> I just need you to download everything from your brain once a week, and I'll upload it. I'll upload it to oh the God, site. you don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> and we also require an e-signature. E-autograph. E-autograph, yeah. guaranteed. <laughs> But yeah, there, there's some, you know, there's some uh, websites that people run that I'm aware of. Uh, there's something like Geology Hub, but I, I don't really know too much about what they sure, do. But sure. yeah, I, I see some of the stuff that they uh, put up on places like Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it these days. So. Yeah, well, let's maybe we'll throw it out there to our audience online. If, if you have a favorite place to go, you're a big fan of geology, of, of studying uh, rocks, studying earth making planet making and uh, you have a favorite place to go for that information you can throw it in the chat and maybe we'll uh, we'll be able to give it a shout out here um, yeah. on SPL because great to keep learning in all the different ways we love what kids are doing in classroom amazing teachers um, we love all the high-level academic research people doing like yeah. Dr. Valve and I'll keep thinking about this through the watch too and uh, <laughs> see if I can come up with a more Thank comprehensive you. list Thank and uh, yeah we'll I'll, I'll, I'll ask Megan if there's some place where we might be able to curate some of that. Yeah. And Oops, nobody, something nobody, went wrong. Nobody buy uh, it's rockoclock.com. That's mine. I claim. <laughs> All dibs. All dibs. I will plug really quick one other source I know of in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month. There's a group called Yay. Heo Latinas. Hey. It's a group of Latina yeah. geologists, and they're really cool, and they're always sharing stuff on their Instagrams and socials. So, Oh, yeah, oh they're God, fantastic. They're so cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah. Love it. Mm. Yes, yeah. yes. Geo-Latinas. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Awesome ladies. Yeah. 
Very awesome. There you go. Across all cultures, languages, people love rocks. Connects us all just like the ocean. And uh, that's awesome. And, you know, so many learners out there is a, a great way. If, if you're going to be spending time kind of scrolling through your social media feeds, always nice when people are dropping knowledge, fun knowledge, easily consumable. So I'm a big fan. Thanks for that, Catalina. Oh, that's a good question. Is salt concentrations, pa'akai, is it greater at the upper layers of the sea compared to the deep kai uli? Where do we find higher concentrations of salt? This is, I um, mean, the, the internet is stumping me. I don't know, actually. Uh, I am calling up Grafana, where yeah. we have a salinity <laughs> monitor. <laughs> yes. I think generally, like, um, in density, salt is denser, and so it Oftentimes we see it sink down, and there's a thing called pinkocline, I think. Oh no, mm -hmm. halocline. Sorry, halocline, yeah. halocline um, that refers to when the salt concentration kind of tapers off a little bit, um, to that point where it's more constant. But generally, it does get saltier deeper you go. Um, it, also, you can see it in Hilo, where we have like a thermal halocline um, with a mix of both temperature and salt. Um, driving that um, density of water and so you have these things called like freshwater lenses where that fresh water floats on the top and then um, all the salt water sinks to the bottom if I'm not mistaken. I'm not too sure. But. I'm looking up charts right now. <laughs> nice data! Kukui, that's uh, kukui, kukui means uh, light also associated with knowledge, so no surprise, could we drop in that knowledge and that light on us? All right, so yeah, it looks like, yeah, we see an increase in density from the surface to about a thousand meters, and then it's relatively constant after mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So, so you're seeing that increase in salinity. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty common um, uh, aspect of the deep ocean and the the surface ocean is sort of a slight. You have a uh, increase until you get to a certain point, and then it's sort of you have slight, very small increases later on. But um, yeah, but the scale I'm looking at yeah. here, it looks like a straight line. So yeah, it, it still it's, increases it's a bit. It's pretty interesting because it does change in certain places too, which is kind of wild. These, there's um, uh, one of the ways that you can kind of track very rudimentary, rudim, um, yeah. You can you can kind of track water movement um, by temperature and salinity, and so um, and because you know dense, cold, highly salty water um, <coughs> is often is found on the the deep. That's the deepest water. It's the most dense, and so you can kind of track. That's um, the current thought process is that that gets created at the poles. That's super de That's super deep. Or sorry. The Bottom super water, right? cold, super saline, because the ice sort of like the you 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 create like a super saline. Anyways, um, so that becomes the bottom water, and it, and it, and then that um, as it mixes, it it changes the that temperature and salinity um, sort of tracer changes as it mixes with different items, different um, components of of the oceans where it you know, sank at different portions or has moved around in the oceans. And so it's pretty interesting. Um, but one of the ways that, uh, and the density, density is, is consistent um, in that you will always have higher density water at the bottom and lower mm -hmm. density water at the top. But there are a couple instances where you will have hotter water in the middle than you do, than and colder water on the top or the bottom, hmm. and that is um, it's 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 this like pinpoint that you're looking at Mediterranean water, because the Mediterranean has really hot water because it's it's if I'm remembering correctly, it's fairly shallow and it's got an interesting circulation pattern where um, uh, the water actually gets heated and and uh, um, decrease uh, increases in salinity, so you have a higher saline water than what's co what's coming in so that's moving out but it's hotter so it's doing this weird thing where it then sort of um it's like an inversion layer right uh yeah I sort think of so. i i think i so? think they have yeah. like a some kind of a different um 
either downwelling current where there's like that cold water that's coming down underneath and now like you said you have mm -hmm. that water because they have they're kind of more enclosed if right, i'm not mistaken right. so they have that cold water coming in down because it's denser and then that hotter um water that's on top that's getting heated and become it's becoming more salty i guess and yeah they have that mixing and so, right and so that goes that goes kind of under the incoming water and then it when it moves into the atlantic it actually is um it's so it's got a higher density than the cooler water so you have like cold surface waters then you've got hotter atlantic mid-ocean waters and then you've got cold waters again and, and just for clarity super interesting um you, you get these uh you get these water sources generated at certain places like the mediterranean or the poles right. and then they and then they all kind of uh, uh move laterally across really huge distances right yeah I think right. they kind of converge yeah kind of yeah. Bit, yeah yeah and they start to mix and it's but it's pretty impressive how far you can um um but yeah, because like bottom water is super traceable. Like that's an important, yeah. uh, an important uh, ocean water tracer, right? Exactly. Yes. I think yeah. they also use isotope analysis they for do. bottom they water do. tracing. Yeah, it's, uh, like Delo eighteen or something. I Sorry, think so, oxygen yeah. isotopes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Exactly. Uh, um, yeah. Isotope yeah. stories. Isotopes. <laughs> it's going in oxygen it's isotopes, everywhere. deep yep. ocean. Yeah. No. And thank you. That was amazing. It's I think pretty interesting. Once I once I got past the like uh, super basic question of where is their salt, I was like, oh no no, actually the it's really climb. cool. Yeah. yeah. That's a cool. That, oh, it's a, oceanography is such a cool science. We, yeah. we got a great recommendation coming in online. It says science.nasa.gov and part of their earth science and oceanography. Um, if you check that out, you can learn all about salinity of the oceans as well. If you, uh, you know, unless you personally know Virginia and Kukui, and they can come and explain it to you again. But uh, absolutely amazing, the halo climb. But to answer the the original question, Paakai concentration is greater as you go deeper near the surface, and then eventually reaches more or less a stable uh, concentration as you get into the depths. But that changes Very with temperature and. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. that's, uh, yeah, so, so yeah, the, the saltier water, if you can get down to about what looks like a thousand meters, yeah, yep. which is about where we are now. So we're, yeah, there we go. we're, we're, uh, we're uh, up at the, up near the upper end of that halo climb already. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty so, cool. The yeah. ocean, ocean, um, tracing water systems and like ocean set, like circulation, it's pretty interesting. Um, and yeah. it's pretty well it's i think it's fairly well described in the atlantic but um it's it's less well described in the pacific um which, okay uh yeah because mm -hmm. there's Pacific's like Pacific's a big place yeah exactly <laughs> it's huge and there's also like you know some there's there are the gyres but there's also like coriolis you know, right and mm -hmm. there's and there's um and then there's and because of coriolis there's then the multiple um large current systems and um you know and they're so large and they're able to move so much water um but you also have like you know uh the um emperor seamount chain right which is this huge chain and some of those are over um reach almost like i think some of those reach like 300 meters so they they're pretty much blocking. They're quite shallow. Uh, they're, they're huge yeah. they're compared to normal seamounts. Kind of like changing that yeah. current going. Right, but yeah. there's very little information that I've been able to find um, on that. That's like recent looking at these sort of. Again, we need more marine these? scientists, all these questions to work on. I know, and Join that's us. just like one tiny <laughs> aspect that I'm interested in because I'm trying to, I'm doing, you know, studies on seamount communities that happens to be one of those you know, seamounts that are in that chain. And so it's kind of like, well, I was like trying to do like a, a short little like introduction, like, oh, this is the current like idea about what the currents are on the seamount. And the answer was, um, I don't really know, you know, like, yeah. where, like what, what is happening? You know, where, where are the currents going through? And um, it's really interesting. Um, I've got a friend who gets very frustrated with it. <laughs> yeah, you that. haven't heard one of my frustrated rants about <laughs> this is something that we should know and we don't. Why has nobody yeah. looked at this? You know, it's so easy to do. Yeah, no, there's, there's so much of that <laughs> in so every field. It's so easy to do. You just got to get to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I when I first took oceanography, first talk, talked about Coriolis. I'm like, what? 
and then we got into Hadley cells oh, and all yeah. these other weather systems. I'm like, how? <laughs> it's so wild to me. It's it's actually really interesting because it's just it's again like the entire planet is so connected from the top of the atmosphere to the bottom of the oceans, yep. right? Like it's it's amazing, right? And a lot of it just has to do with spinning. Yep. Yep. And a lot of thermodynamics. Yes. Yep, and a little bit yeah. of latitude. So yeah. um, oxygen isotopes, the reason we were talking about that a little bit ago, mm -hmm. um, as a tracer of things like uh, like uh, Antarctic bottom water, is that um, you can actually uh, you can actually see a change in the isotopic composition of oxygen and things like water uh, uh, as a function of latitude. And you can also use that as a proxy for temperature because um, yeah, if you have different isotopes of oxygen, like oxygen 18 or oxygen 16, uh, oxygen 18 is just a little bit heavier and it takes just a little bit more energy to move it. Um, so if you apply the same amount of force to uh, oxygen, and uh, you know, one atom of oxygen 16 versus 18, that 16 will move a little bit further. And you can actually, over time, uh, that, that little mass difference in an energetic environment will um, kind of accumulate and you'll end up seeing uh, differences uh, over over space and time uh, between your uh, uh, proportions of your six, uh, oxygen 16 to 18. And uh, yeah, you can actually get like um, uh, changes over latitude as like, you know, um, atmosphere kind of kind of rains things out and you'll see uh, uh, you'll see those shifts and uh, Antarctic bottom water being uh, 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 generated at the pole will have a very distinctive um, uh, isotopic signature in you know in its oxygen isotopes because um, because of that uh, that whole uh, effect and we call that we call that mass fractionation or mass dependent fractionation so it's it's all it's all kinetics it's all physics really once you get far enough into things like chemistry or um, you know geology isotopes a lot of it kind of ends up being rooted in physics. <laughs> <laughs> well, then there's also tracers. Um, it's it's kind of interesting, you know. We've the Anthropocene, right? Like humans are having impacts, and so one of the ways that you can you can track water, like re more recent water mass movements, is actually using some of the components that that humans have put into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those is, is uh, the like CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, right? That, yep. That were and like refrigerants and um. Oh, gotta love those fluorine know. components. Right, and they're and so useful for some things, but they are <laughs> so bad for us. <laughs> yeah, well, there is that. So and very know. traceable because they right. last forever. Very traceable, and so people are able to trace. You know, it, it's one of the ways that people have theorized that these where we think water is subsist subsiding where it is being you know cooled and um you know the salt is being sort of re uh, increasing basically where they think that the density of water changes due to um natural effects of of temperature basically um they're also able to not just hy hypothesize that based on the temperature and, and, and salinity of the water, but also based off of some of these these ocean tracers and the newest ones, you know, being like CFCs, um, as well as like, you know, uh, uh, bomb radiocarbon tracing and that sort yeah. of thing. And you that, know. that's radioactive decay as a tracer rather than mm -hmm. a mass dependent one. So that's, you know, we, we can trace, we can use these tracers in different ways. Right, right. Which is um, the, the lovely thing about isotopes. It's really, they're, they're so yeah. versatile. It's really interesting. And then also just oxygen utilization. Yeah. You know, how much oxygen is is around um, in the ocean? Has it been used up? How, how long has it been since that parcel of water was exposed to um, the surface mm -hmm. or organisms that are able to put more oxygen back into the water? And yeah. I, yeah. I think uh, there is some... I feel like I learned something about um, people using these um, zooplankton, these um, coccolithophores that mm. utilize these isotopes in their shells. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it was oxygen isotopes or something, but like they, um, they incorporate, yeah, they incorporate those more denser oxygen isotopes in their in their carboniferous like shells and their armor, and so they use those to. I might be mistaken, but they use those to kind of 
kind of, yeah, detect like what the paleo-oceanography climate was mm. back then, and also using radio radioactive isotopic dating as well on these um, carboniferous um, organisms. Yep, yeah. no, that's exactly that's right. Amazing. Yeah, we can even do it with uh, uh, teeth and fossils. <gasps> Oh boy. Can we add this to the isotope stories? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. it's already yes. got, I've yeah, already you, got you half can, that chapter written just yeah, listening yeah. to you guys. This is awesome. Yeah, you can do that with, with bones, you know. Um, yeah, uh, you, you can you can figure out about, uh, like, uh, you can figure out, you know, climate information about where a human or some other species lived. Um, sometimes even what they ate because uh, there are uh, certain uh, isotopic processes with uh, that involve carbon um, you know so you can get certain types of uh, uh, metabolisms or like uh, you know basically the energy we generate for our cells uh, ATP adenosine triphosphate um, and, and uh, ADP I forget what that one stands for adenosine diphosphate I think um, yeah, we, we generate those in certain ways by metabolizing food, and uh, depending on that metabolic process, you can have um, like different. Uh, it can fractionate um, the carbon isotopes in our bodies and in that food is in, in a certain way, and yeah. Um, so you can tell sometimes through the isotopes what kinds of what kinds of plants mm -hmm. uh, you know an organism may have eaten. You can have like C3 versus C4 stuff. I think corn is like a C4 plant or something yes. like that. I don't know. I'm, yeah. I'm getting rusty on that. Yeah. But no, yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, that's why you don't ask us about the halo climb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're going to get it. You ask us about the halo uh, climb. Well, it's interesting because I was going to continue because corals um, have, have uh, calcium carbonate. And so they've got the carbon and they've got um, everything that they bring in with the minerals and the ratios um you know they're able to bring in different minerals based on um you know the the current climate and so because corals can be so long lived and because there's some skeletons um get uh preserved for long periods of time as well you're able to get really accurate dating um and environmental information that mm -hmm. can tell you about the surface because the surface is where the the food's coming from but then also about the water that it's actually in because that's where the carbonate and the, that chemistry is coming from. Is this too. where the carbonate polymorph story g comes into play? <laughs> uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah, because uh, yeah, you can get uh, two, two minerals with the same chemical composition, just different structure. So one mm -hmm. is uh, calcite, one is aragonite, and uh, uh, they're, they're stable at very slightly different uh, temperature pressure conditions. Right. Yeah. Right. And so there are, um, there are organisms that will, I'm not sure if there are corals that will actually flip between aragonite and calcite, but there are definitely organisms that will um, have the aragonite sort of attached to like uh, different components, right? Um, I really? Think, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> we'll be um, right back with you on that. Yeah, oh, we're nerding out so hard back uh, here. <laughs> I love it. This is what you get when you ask us about the halo climb. climb. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. There are other. There. It's also been a busy day. <laughs> there are. Um, there all. are um, ions that can stabilize, sort of these like aragonite and calcite, and so one of the common oh, ones cool. is mag manganese. I didn't know that. Uh, I like kind of knew it, so it's like um, basically the r the ratios of like these stabilizing ions can also be really important for aragonite um, and such. Huh. So, well, you know, I've taken yeah. mineralogy, and today I just learned something brand spanking new about uh, calcite and aragonite. So, Corals. dropping some knowledge bombs yeah. over here. Well, go. one of the reasons Mahalo. why. Um, uh, sclerotinian corals, these hard corals, are, um, are so at risk of ocean acidification is because they specifically use aragonite, um, and oh. aragonite is uh, less stable than calcite. Yeah, which at least is in the which current is conditions. why the magnesium, the er, Manganese, yeah, which is why it would be important to have some of those stabilizing um, ions as well. Yeah, so, um, it's it's really interesting to sort of see some of the how how that plays out too. Yeah, because if I yeah. remember correctly, there was at least one point in Earth's geologic history where uh, aragonite was the more stabilizing, uh, the more stable phase um, for some of these skeletons. Mm. But I, um, do not know. I believe, but yeah, right now um, carbonate's the more stable phase. 
Amazing. Mm. I'm we have look uh, that up. It I'll relates. Say. It relates to a great question coming in from online. Someone is really interested in marine sciences, especially marine geology, but really has terrible motion sickness. Mm. Is it still possible to get into the field when the field work, like what we're doing on board the Nautilus, isn't doable? I'll just say my quick answer is. Um, Dr. Val described the science we're doing here as a little bit of a cowboy geologist or cowgirl <laughs> geologist. Or, uh, Occasionally. So, so it, you know, a lot of folks are doing this work in the lab with data that's collected by teams on board ships like the Nautilus, other research vessels. Um, it, but it is a lot of fun. I will say I wouldn't let uh, motion sickness, even terrible motion sickness, totally stop you from getting out into the field. I think it's important uh, to so, connect with the rocks in these places. Can I, can I jump in here? Please. Oh, yeah. I get really, really motion sick. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. I rely on scopolamine to make this happen, and a couple of days ago, for whatever reason, it stopped working for me, and I got really, really motion sick. And um, it took it took a little while to get over, and I'm doing a lot better now. But it is entirely possible to do this, and you know, have and have to deal with it. Um, so yeah, consider um, yourself recruited. Not all of us, not yeah. not all of us, uh, <laughs> can can do it just with our own. Uh, our own brains. We need a little bit of help from some uh, medication. Oh. Yeah, and um, you know, I've been I've been working on boats, you know, for several years, and I always get. Now, there's also there are many different levels of seasickness and motion True. sickness. So, like, totally valid to feel like you are unable to come out here because you you know you feel like you would be um, ill to the point that it would be detrimental to your health or your work. But um, you know, as someone who gets mildly seasick, uh, I or I get mildly seasick every single time I come out here. Um, and like, uh, for me, I'm still able to function and get work done. But the other thing too is, you know, there there are ways to get access to a lot of this data yourself. Um, there are online resources, there's online databases. Um, and, you know, there there are people who love coming out here and, and, and doing this work. and. Um, I think there are ways to get involved that might not require you coming out to sea. Um, and there's also, you know, shallow, shallower trips, you know, you can, maybe you can um, uh, get access to, you know, a, a trip on, on some, on a lake first. Try it, try it out. It, it is different from being in a car. Very different if, if that's, you know, what someone's basing their potential motion sickness on, so. I think bottom line from what I'm hearing from both of you is if they are in fact that interested in geology, marine mm -hmm. geology, any scientific field, um, we, we need them. Yeah. We need them well, in the, to pursue too. these fields and, and there's ways to do it um, working around whatever um, inhibitions or factors might be keeping us, mm -hmm. making it more difficult for us. Uh, those things can be overcome and there's lots of ways to do this work. It looks yeah. very different for everyone. Yep. And so we, we uh, it's definitely doable. We, we, yeah, uh, you can be a marine watching. geologist without ever going to sea. You could be one of our scientists ashore who help us because uh, we're nothing without um, we're nothing without our team ashore. They they help us so much. Are there mar okay? I'm. This is this is a we're getting on a question here that's maybe silly. But I like it. I don't believe in silly <laughs> questions. <laughs> I do, and I love them. <laughs> I'm over here like okay. The, the land's pretty old, right? And and there used to be oceans over over top of a lot of different parcels of land. Are there marine rocks that someone could study? Whoa, Ooh. that was a cool Ooh. Tina for. Oh, I um, totally missed it. Are there marine rocks on land? Like, could you study marine geology and just not ever have to get on a boat? 100% yes. Cliffs of Dover. Oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. like there used to be an, something called an Epiric Sea over much of the southwest, and an Epiric Sea is a very shallow ocean sea, and uh, yeah, that's got a very rich history to it. There are all okay. sorts of marine organisms uh, uh, preserved in uh, like limestones and other strata that have been uplifted and have become parts of continents. Um, plenty of those in the Appalachians, in Antarctica, uh, all over the world. Um, and yeah, if you want to work on uh, some stuff that has been sampled from, uh, you know, today's oceanic environments, we have whole repositories uh, in several locations across the world, uh, several of which are in the U.S., um, that um, 
you can request uh, samples from for your research. So they're, they're open to scientists who are interested in working on those. And all you gotta do is uh, get in touch with them and uh, do a little paperwork, uh, get, a, get a sample loan request filled out, and uh, yeah, you get, you get rocks in your mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> and it's delightful. It's like Christmas time. It is. Oh my yeah. goodness. I, I love that. I love that uh, creative thinking on your part, Virginia, to realize that wait, a lot of our yeah. planet is covered in ocean. And, and we know that so many um, seamounts eventually make their way above the surface. So younger mm -hmm. volcanoes, not, not necessarily ancient geology, but, but uh, active volcanoes right now uh, around the Pacific Rim, volcanically yeah, active places mm -hmm. in the world are, are right there at the edge of being uh, on the surface. I'd, I love the book Krakatoa. I don't know if you guys have mm. an incredible oh, yeah, volcano uh, uh, erupted about 150 years ago in Indonesia, maybe. 1883. Yeah, 1883, that's right. Oh, 140 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, absolutely remarkable story. Um, and that, that volcano, I think, is still still active. Between still very Java active. and Sumatra, quite yeah, active volcano. Yeah, now known as Anak Krakatau, or son of yeah. Krakatau. Krakatau, yeah. yeah. Krakatau. Yeah, yeah, incredible. But yeah, that wasn't a silly question at all. That was a great I question. Yeah. <laughs> that leads me to another question. So, since we have the... I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I love it. This is fantastic. No, no apologies I'm needed. all about this. We get all this. of our questions today. Ooh, fish, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, when these fossils get fossilized and then preserved in the geologic record, is it possible that... Or is, like, all land going to be eventually subducted and then re-enter in the kind of the mantle of the magma chamber and then get like get like processing that magma again and then erupt again as new land or and do those fossils go with it um some of it will there there's um uh, there's some rocks that are harder su to subduct than others so okay. like uh low, lower density rocks uh you know things like uh granites um uh, for example, some some of those we think may get potentially subducted into the mantle in small quantities, um, but yeah, um, there there's also like pelagic uh, sediments or like uh, terrestrial sediments that uh, uh, can end up um, washing into subduction zones, and you get this big sedimentary wedge that forms, and some of that seems to go down, and we we see evidence of uh, recycling of like pelagic and continental sediments and stuff like that, and in, uh, in certain places. So yeah, definitely. And if, if there are fossils with those, yeah, those will go down too. Aww. You know, there's actually been bacteria that's been found um, alive in subduction zones. Like, they like uh, yeah, the Joides resolution is drilled down into some subduction zones and they've uh, pulled up some, some core samples that I believe were found to uh, have um, certain uh, chemosynthetic bacteria that were thriving under those extreme conditions. How, wow. Yeah, it's fascinating. <gasps> Wow, that's amazing. Thank you so yeah. much. But yeah, not not wow. all of the crust will be, uh, not everything will be subducted most likely. I mean, we've, okay. still, we've still got some some parcels of uh, uh, like really, truly ancient uh, rocks. So, you know, things called cratons, which are these unusually thick parcels of land that kind of, uh, they're, a lot of them were formed, uh, we think, during the Archean, you know, somewhere between about three and a half to about 2.7 billion years ago. and depending on who you talk to, those ages can vary slightly. Um, probably a big episode of that building happened around 2.7-ish billion years ago. And uh, those are actually kind of like the like like the, the core component of uh, uh, continents that have built up over time. So you get you get these like really old packages of land uh, kind of jumbled together and they get uh, younger and younger terrains and stuff accreted onto them over time to build up you know what what we're familiar with seeing on maps today so okay. th those um so some of that stuff is probably never really going to subduct it's probably always just going to keep moving around uh on uh, earth's surface uh colliding breaking apart you know uh, uh just slowly transforming into yeah. smaller and smaller Bits, yeah. I imagine, are not necessarily, well, not necessarily. sometimes bigger Some, bits, sometimes smaller bits. Rocks or... Yeah, because we've been through several yeah. supercontinent cycles, we think, over the course of Earth's history, and uh, you know we can't necessarily rule out that happening again um, in uh, you know many millions of years uh, from now. Well, it's it just a matter me. of where where's that supercontinent going to be, and 
you know, what are we going to call it? <laughs> it's amazing. The, the, the spectrum, you know, you think about some of the biology we encounter here, and we've been marveling at how old some of this biology is. Well, my understanding is the reality for biological forms, we're so transient, right? Even pretty much our entire bodies are made up of completely different molecules within, you know, years, right? We have, we just go through this transformation and cycling, but these well, rocks like are... like the ships of Theseus, yeah. it's kind of creepy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so these, these, these stones, these rocks, uh, they are basically keeping their same form, keeping these, uh, these elements, these molecules bound, you know, for millions of years, and uh, before they go through these you know, cycles of subduction or, or breaking apart and, and maybe taking some new form, but you you don't see this kind of molecular atomic interchange that we get with biology. It's yeah. just a, such a different scale. It's a really fascinating. Aren't, aren't there some species that have uh, kind of existed with more or less uh, the same body plan for really long periods of time too? Like geologically relevant time scales? I think um, so, but I imagine their cells are still are still the dying oh. off and, and oh yeah for sure and new Self cells are being cells, born so absolutely. they're they're a totally different organism molecularly speaking than they are true right? yeah. yeah 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 like a lot of the archaeans are probably one of the part of those species that's kind of fascinating to me like a lot of species i feel that, that retain that same morphotype but as you said change molecularly with the environment are microorganisms by the way different archaean than what i was just talking about <laughs> oh yeah, yeah sorry sorry yeah, yeah. the the um <laughs> What did you say? The microorganism, arc and the arcane is the time period. Time period. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, just uh, when terminology overlaps. <laughs> it's always funny when it does. When biology and geology collides. <laughs> ah, yes. I love it when that happens. Anyway, go on. Sorry. Oh, no, that, that yeah, that was just all of, yeah. I yeah. Love my on that. yeah. Well, you got me curious, I and so I, so I looked up um, sponges, because sponges are some of the oldest um, forms of you know, uh, life that we, you know, that we, that we understand. Um, and, uh, apparently they have existed in Earth's oceans, um, s since for the last, uh, 890 million years. Whoa. Um, oh my God. That is some deep time. Oh. Which is absolutely wild. Um, and these ancient sponges might be the earliest known remnants of the animal body. Wow. Um, wow. So. That's incredible. Yeah. So and that, I wonder how true. often a sponge's form cycles through like a shift in all of its cells. Like, I mean, in the deep mm -hmm. sea, there's not that much access to new material to build from. And, and well, no, but sponges can participate. I mean, s sponges have bacteria i mean we don't know a ton right and i don't know a ton about sponges either but i'm pretty sure that sponges have access to the bacterial loop for resources and so mm -hmm. while they might not have new new carbon right like they don't have like access to you know a live phytoplankton they do have access to the nutrients that are recycled by the bacteria that they're you know i think um and so it's um, just another form of cycling using yeah, the yeah. nutrients cycle yeah, so through the bacteria. Have, totally. You know, they still have some, some of that, um, the carbon and the, and the you know the nutrients they need, um, and I think you know I think sponges not only are part of the bacteria loop, but they actually might be able to eat some bacteria and such, and so that's huh. like a direct link from one of the the key um, recyclers yeah. in you know the deep ocean. Amazing. Wow. It's like OG animal right there. Oh no, wow. for real. Yeah. I don't even That's amazing. I mean that time scale does not mean anything to me in real <laughs> life, really and truly. Speaking about time scales, I also try to look up like one of the oldest fossil records. Yes. And one of them is of cyanobacteria. Of mm. uh, their record starts about 1.9 billion years ago. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're one of I think they're like the first oxygen producing species yeah, or organism on earth. Yeah, that and sounds about right. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. All of this talk about like how species have evolved and also have just remained in the same kind of morphotype throughout like evolutionary like geologic time periods it's kind of fascinating mm. it is to see like yeah you know, but some, also how they molecularly change as well right yeah some people hypothesize that um 
if you provide the conditions for life to form on a planet that it it may arise it may be an inevitability and i don't you know i, I don't necessarily take a side on that one i'm you know i'm, I'm on the fence because it's it's way out of my field but it's it's one of those really interesting philosophical things to think about you know um if it's it's a, it's a whole quote from jurassic park right you know life mm -hmm. finds a way and it's it, it makes it makes me think about just how common that might or might not be throughout the universe on other Earth-like planets that we just haven't been able to detect yet because we just don't quite have all the technology for that yet. Oh man, I've got right? two really cool segues that we can go in. Can well, we do both of them? Both. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we probably have time. We're a little long-winded. All right, I'm going to talk about my friend's about research. Yeah, we're later. just like doing the hardcore science talk, talk yeah. here today. I've, I'm going to talk about my friend's research first, and then I want to talk about um, uh, life on exoplanets. Yeah, yes, let's wait, wait, do wait. it. Oh, well, first okay. question, what's an exoplanet? Like, not planets in our solar system. Okay, planets cool. around that's other cool. stars. Okay. That's, my, yeah. that's, that's what I think it means, at least. Um, so my friend is actually studying sort of like... Um, it's really interesting. She So she's a like organic chemistry physicist too Ooh. it's a wild combination Ooh, well, um, I like that. she's one of the smartest people i know and she's basically like looking at um some of the minerals and and items around um serpentinization oh, which is like okay. when if correct me if i'm wrong because i only kind of sort of understand this it's basically like rocks sort of just like all of a sudden creating all the minerals that you need to for like um i have forgotten what it means actually so i work on serpentinites occasionally oh um, fantastic please tell it's us. uh uh that, that's a process where you're basically uh hydrating um like mafic or ultra mafic rocks so you, you can uh, you can basically generate uh serpentinites for things like uh um olivine rich things uh, including parts of the upper mantle so it's it's a it's a hydration process that involves um a, a lot of uh like magnesium, iron, silicate mm -hmm. uh, types of minerals. So, um, yeah, uh, same yeah. class of minerals as things like asbestos. Fun right. fact. Oh, but yeah, like, um, the, like the thing in paint that was used to be used in paint or something? Um, used as a, a fire retardant material. Uh, gotcha. yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's yeah. a... Yeah, that's that's pretty much what serpentinization is. It's a hydration yeah. hydration uh, process. Yeah, and I think one of the things that they're that you know is is that like you know high, basically hot rocks and around like hydrothermal vents might have been able to create a lot of the like key components of life, sort of sort of that sort of scenario, and so then you get bacteria, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So she's kind of studying like the forms that just kind of create, just pop up when you start, mm -hmm. you know throwing throwing the uh you know compounds together throwing the ingredients together yeah throwing yeah. the ingredients together what are the forms that pop up um it's absolutely wild i do not understand the actual um chemistry of it but i remember so, reading yeah. something a long time ago about like the natural occurrence of like self-replicating molecules and like mm -hmm. whether or not that you could somehow jump from that to a more complex uh like sort of metabolic process or like you know simple cells or something like that yeah. is that what she's working on no I, th I mean i think she's literally like throwing these things together and staring at it under a microscope okay yeah it's kind of looking at like yeah. what kind of you know I, I don't i don't really like this term but like primordial soup kind of kind of stuff i think yes but like very different too you right. know not not like throwing things in a bottle and like leaving right it for yeah years. There's yeah there's there's a ton more yeah. nuance to stuff like this yeah so yeah that's pretty interesting and i thought it was um that's fascinating yeah very very uh similar to like you know new new life and then um the exoplanet thing there is someone at i think uh well i don't remember where where he does his research but um he came and did a, a seminar at, at FSU, and he was talking about how do we detect life on an exoplanet from Earth? 
because you know we all <laughs> we all yeah we all think about right like okay well we create ox like you know oh there's life on this earth because there's oxygen well there can be our oxygen for many different reasons and like you mm -hmm. know and i'm just like you know and then and he's also the aspect of like okay well how far away from a uh, sun are you and then like, that will change what type of like um, reactions are happening naturally versus yeah, because like because of uh, like where you are like, in the habitable oh zone and right. or in or out of it or whatever. Yeah, right. and yeah. and that also changes the like chemical reactions of just different you know common compounds of different temperatures and solar radiation and it is it is truly truly um like it is out there and it is amazing and um i think it's like a true mix of sci-fi and there and is real science yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. We've, we've been actively looking for a lot of this stuff yeah. um like that recent detection uh which you know it's it's been a little bit debatable based on the uh technology used mm -hmm. and uh, uh how to interpret uh you know some of the uh, uh you know some of the uh, spectra involved with this but like uh, you know people have argued that hey maybe we're seeing signs of life on venus because of the detection of phosphine gas in its atmosphere which um it, you know that can be produced by um uh, uh biotic processes although it can also be produced by volcanoes but it's yeah. a it's a very short-lived transient uh, uh compound so if you if you see wisps of that you know you, you know you're looking at something that happened very very recently like near real time mm -hmm. Um, I tend to lead toward volcanism because um, I think there's pretty good evidence for active volcanism on Venus, but um, you definitely can't rule out um, some sort of biological signature like that. Yeah. And I think I saw something else in the news uh, about um, an exoplanet uh, potential life sign detection. Oh, so I'm going to try, I'm gonna try to find that because, yeah, yeah uh, this whole astrobiology field that's kind of yeah. growing right now and uh, just kind of in its infancy. Um, you know, where geology, you know, we're, we're arguably still in the toddler uh, stage. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's just amazing to see uh, what kinds of uh, uh, novel methodology and just paradigms and modes of thought are, uh, are developing oh, yeah. in this field. And, yeah, the detection of um, various things, you know, various aspects of uh, exoplanets, like signs of life, composition, atmospheric uh, mm -hmm. uh, compositions using, you know, just methods that we kind of on our faces when uh, uh initially wouldn't believe it would be even possible it's just so it's just so freaking cool the Two things. way that they were saying that they like measure the because how do you measure comp components in an atmosphere like light years away basically right spectrometers yeah. and <laughs> you're just like you're waiting for it to move in front of the sun so that you can get it the atmosphere which is like a teensy tiny little portion of just around and i'm like what what are we doing science like how we're doing amazing things how did we do that how you need you need to know the spectrum like the green flash though it's exactly the same <laughs> yes phenomenon. actually it yeah. is <laughs> hey i saw a green flash last night did you really i did i'll say wow. so that she also saw one too yeah. or i think at the first first sunset but yeah yeah i mean two things yeah. stand out to me from the conversation one is uh, it all comes back down to physics yeah and then <laughs> yeah. and then virginia's point to you know we have a very earth it's because it's our only reference oh, point. We have a very Earth-centric uh, view of life and definition uh, of life. Mm -hmm. But if we think about physics and and really energy just being matter and just transforming its sort of state, and just life as sort of the most complex forms of that that are cycling through at sort of ridiculous scales, transforming and, and, and all the time, mm -hmm. continuously, uh, then, you know, if we expand our definition of life, I think we'd probably start finding a lot more signs of things that are incredibly complex in organization and transforming their state of energy and, mat and mass and matter at similar cycles, similar rates to us. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, but if we look for another Earth, probably not going to find one. Right. Yeah. But if we look for life in some sort of broader universal definition, mm -hmm. it's very hard we to arrive well. at. But we right. might we might find more evidence of that yeah 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 beautiful thought like i feel like yeah since like we only have earth as a reference mm -hmm. and sometimes we also only have us like humans as a reference too right like analyzing like anabolic like metabolic processes and analyzing you no know, different like anatomical features of different organisms but yeah if we i do i definitely agree with that like if we expand our definition of life 
that is critical. And we, we have yeah. questions yeah. about uh, hydrothermal vents, right? It was oh, this yeah. shocking yep. moment when we realized that, wow, life does not is not limited by light. Right. It was this really transformative moment and realizing, wow, life on Earth likely w was able to be here for so long because yeah. of chemosynthesis, it stop not at photosynthesis. The surface. So, mm, yeah. Yeah, life yeah, really, is everywhere. Really remarkable. Yeah, yeah, I feel like that's one of the oldest processes here, too. Yes. Probably, yeah. Yeah, because we, like, Earth came from pool and mm -hmm. then all. And then yes. so there's definitely had to be something during pool when and then when light came off or it came, came on, sorry, yeah. came on. And then you just have this... Um, what we are conscious of or that we are aware of the other organisms that start popping up but yeah mm -hmm. i feel like once we like get into that that detail of like what came through complex processes like chemosynthesis without light i think that will also help us expand mm -hmm. our what we understand is life yeah. so i think so yeah. yeah and yeah the uh this the, I found the thing on the other exoplanet. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, it's from the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, one of its observations. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been looking at uh, uh, one exoplanet uh, called K2-18b, and they've been... Uh, Terrible name. <laughs> you know, you got to classify them somehow. <laughs> I, I some Hawaiian kids world. to rename these. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could have some help naming the rocks, but uh, yeah, we have similarly pretty dry sample, working sample names for them at the moment. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a standardized system, so it makes it a little easy. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, they've been finding uh, some carbon-bearing molecules in this exoplanet's atmosphere, along with a scarcity of ammonia. And more recently, they found a compound called dimethyl sulfide uh, possibly present uh, on that planet, which uh, supposedly is only produced by life. But that's using the on-Earth reference, like Kukui was just talking about. So. Um, you know, we're, we're still only able to bring all of all of these inferences back to a reference point that we know, which may not necessarily be the only reference point. Yeah. So, yeah. Complexity so and transformation. That chemical is what you smell when you smell the ocean, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, this article is saying, uh, yeah, dimethyl sulfate is uh, mostly ocean produced smell. by phytoplankton. I love it. Yeah. My f one of my favorite smells on Earth. <laughs> yep. Wow. And that also like brings like um, what Daniel was mentioning about chemosynthesis. You know, a lot of these um, not only like bacteria, but also these. Um, what is the level below bacteria? Oh, but yeah. Anyway, like these bacteria um, have these complex um, immune systems. I was just reading about it. Um, CRISPR, um, oh, yeah. those repeated sequence techniques, and like it's it's so mind-boggling that we are we're at the tip of the iceberg when we're understanding these complex processes um, from chemosynthesis to how these organisms are metabolizing those compounds to create life for themselves and then seeing how those bacteria have other sources that allow them to live like their own immune systems and like seeing how they fight against viruses that reside within that same environment yeah with viruses them. Yeah. viruses are just like that's a whole nother Ooh, world. That is. Yeah. It truly is. Oh, man. Again, I think there's going to, I think we're, we'll probably see, perhaps in our lifetime, maybe longer, but I think the, the definitions around what we consider life in the universe to have to expand beyond mm -hmm. what we, how we've oh. limited that here on Earth. And yeah. if, you, if you just see complexity of organization and transformation of energy and matter at, at, at high speeds, constant evolution, I think, uh, I think there's a good chance we'll, we'll find it. We have um, a great uh, great quote shared with us and the famous Arthur C. Clarke quote saying, sufficiently advanced science is indistinguishable from magic, mm -hmm. but to the novice, all science is in indistinguishable from magic. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very true. That's yeah. such a good quote. Mm -hmm. so we'll, thank you uh, for sharing it. Yeah, mahalo yeah thank you. Me. Mahalo to, to our Arthur C. Clarke is one of my favorite sci-fi authors. Ayo, ayo. Yeah, mine as well. Wait, which one, which which ones he uh, he wrote 2001 a space odyssey oh. and uh, uh, the Rama series mm -hmm. yeah great also a shout out to my mom she's uh, she's in Sorrento Italy mom you shouldn't be watching go go drink some wine <laughs> enjoy yourself <laughs> uh, go go hang out that's uh, so kind hey, we Italy. love it when family says hi I know I, I love it mom thank you mahalo nui. <laughs> now, go enjoy Italy, please. I'm enjoying the deep sea. Oh. Hey, she can enjoy both. <laughs> <laughs>
probably at the it's same time. Early in the morning for wine. It is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. It's a little early for wine. You're right. Thanks, Robert. <laughs> We appreciate all of our viewers, family, friends, colleagues, fellow deep sea travelers um, on the Ala Omoana Kaiuli with us. We have viewers from the United States, Australia, Japan, Canada, Italy, Chuma, United Kingdom, Germany, France, Serbia, Portugal, um, Norway, New Zealand, the Philippines, Poland, the Netherlands, Hungary, the Czech Republic. We appreciate all of you tuning in and we know we have more on YouTube as well. Um, come on over, share your questions, comments, stories with us. We'll be on the seafloor shortly. Um, and I know we're all looking forward to it. Mahalo you all. That was a fun, uh, that was a fun yeah. conversation. Yeah, yeah. mahalo. <laughs> Maybe they really should keep asking us about the halo climb. <laughs> You know, those scales, the, the, you know, this is scales of time and, and of change and transformation that we've been talking about across life, across our planet, across the universe. You know, it does draw me back to the Kumulipo and what you referred to, Kukui, as you, as you talked about everything coming from Po into Ao. And I've uh, been learning so much about that. Thanks to you, Mahina, Mahina Lani, and thanks to Malia, just, uh, and, and all the awesome Hawaiians on board and, and so many of our teachers. Um, both on and off this va'a, the exploration vessel Nautilus. So, yeah, amazing. These are stories that have been, uh, th these kinds of conversations have been had for so many thousands of years as people have gathered on canoes, around fires, and around the shared work of living well together on this planet. And uh, it's just, a, I cherish getting to do that with all of you out here in Papahanao Mokuakea on board the Nautilus. Mahalo mm Nui, -hmm. Dad. Ew. Ew. And thank you for facilitating all these wonderful conversations as well, <laughs> and for starting oh, them, yeah. and for, for all the mana'o that has been shared too. Mm -hmm. yeah. All we need is some ava. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. Mm -hmm. So I have a fun halo climb story. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Hey, hey, let's keep the right. halo climb going. Yes. <laughs> the party continues. <laughs> The science party. Well, it's, it's a it's a challenge to try and dive with an ROV or a submarine into a high salinity environment. So we've we've done things like load up with extra weights and try and go directly into the halo climb, mm -hmm. and it's like you slamming on the brakes. Oh wow! Oh wow! <laughs> no way! That's pretty crazy. Yeah, they're trying to the dive salt just stops in you. Yeah, in the, uh, in some of these brine lakes. Oh, because right. they're so buoyant, huh? Yeah, they create such buoyancy. So you, you get up ahead of steam and with some extra weight and try and get down in it. But mm. Yeah, you got to blast through it, huh? It's yeah. like leaving that. It's like getting out of the atmosphere. Yeah, without all the heat, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> without all the heat, yeah. The so how is it for the return trip? Do you have to kind of thrust through it? <laughs> is there like a layer that makes it a little harder to? Breakthrough. To to do what? To ascend from. If oh you're no! Cool. Well, no, because it's, it's dense. You float right up to the top. You know. Okay. It's like swimming in the Great Salt Lake. You're right. I'm just so floaty. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a, a quick salt water anecdote as well. Current affairs in on the Gulf Coast uh, at the Mississippi River. The because of kind of drought conditions. Um, the freshwater flow has been low enough that they're worried about salt water, a salt water wedge basically coming up the river as far as New Orleans, which is pretty oh, wow. crazy because it's like a pretty Whoa. far way up. And so one of like the steps to try and mitigate that is they're going to basically try and build up a sill near, I don't know, somewhere near the mouth to try and stop that since it's, you know, denser and will stay closer to the bottom. Oh. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. My sister works for the Army Corps and I think, I'm, I'm guessing they're the ones involved with that. And I just think it's so incredible, like the size of these projects that they do and like wow. the impact. What of could it. go wrong? An underwater, an underwater <laughs> levee, basically. <laughs> that is wild. Yeah. Let's trap the salt in the Gulf. <laughs> what could go wrong? Mm. Okay, we're getting close to the bottom here. Okie dokie. Right. You heard it first from Robert Aquaman Waters. We're getting close <laughs> to the bottom. <laughs> and uh, we are going to be quiet as we as we approach and uh, allow our amazing front row team to to bring us down safely but 
We appreciate everyone being on board with us. What's the depth at, at the target, Robert? 2489. Okay. Is what's claimed. Yeah, All we're right. at just over 2300 right now. So we're, but we're like 100 meters from the, the target. Okay. But it looks like the same, same depth yeah. range. Yeah. And only an hour left in our watch. Where did it all go? Oh my goodness. No, we didn't start right at eight either. That's true. And we went down the rabbit hole. <laughs> we did go down a few <laughs> rabbit holes. <laughs> yeah, that was great. That's the nature of the biz though. That's what the blue water challenges. does. Sure is. What, uh, what miracle are we going to see this time? Who knows? Yeah, they'll be revealed to us in just a few minutes. I think we're going to see some rocks. <laughs> I think we're going to see some corals. <laughs> I want to manifest Dumbo Octopus. <laughs> oh. Well, I'd be here for a Dumbo Octopus. I do believe we are the only, we're, we're the sole watch that has not seen a Dumbo Octopus. No in the Zach saw a couple in Atlanta Cam. I did a few times and everyone was kind of busy. I'm trying to point them out. I was like, look, there's devils in the background and everyone's just kind of just like doing whatever. And I'm just like, okay. Zach, we're yeah. in the rabbit just hole. Pull us out. out, baby. Yell them yeah. out. Yeah, I, I got to say, Dumbo Octopus is like a number one yeah, priority. In, in the whole like operational structure, that that that's tied with like, you know, <laughs> ROV maneuvers. <laughs> Unofficially, uh, this is this is not sponsored by OET. My statement. <laughs> <laughs> One of our viewers earlier noted, uh, just related to our earlier conversation, that yes, absolutely, SETI, the search for uh, extraterrestrial uh, life and habitats, does work with EV Nautilus, exploration vessel mm -hmm. Nautilus, to test some of uh, their sensor equipment mm -hmm. and arrays that they've All been right. developing. So. Uh, we're, we're doing exploration together in the deep sea and the deep universe, looking uh, at sea mounts and exoplanets. You know, I was thinking that it probably takes a pretty similar type of person to study the deep sea and, and exoplanets, to be completely honest. Yeah. I could see that. Yeah. I could see that. Hey, I could I jump in just really quick with an operational thing? Oh, yeah. Please. Um, Robert, just a heads up. So we're kind of, it's the end of that move that I had called just to get us on the waypoint yep. and um atalanta is ahead and so we'll be coming up on a little bit higher of a slope than herc right now yeah so just just a heads up as we yep. as we get there yeah. i'm back it up to let it settle back okay this way okay towards the target cool thanks guys thank you no no problem that takes precedence over whatever we're uh, <laughs> going on about <laughs>
hundred meters or so off uh, bottom per our map data. Might be a little bit of uncertainty in there, so mm -hmm. yeah, a few more minutes and uh, blue water will be over. Oh, yeah. What a shame. <laughs> I, I didn't get to use any of the fun facts that I googled. But you had so many other fun facts. <laughs> well, you have about six minutes to, to, to say that. That is true. That is true. All right, rapid fire fun fact. Rapid fire. <laughs> squid never drink heavy water. Squid have two tentacles that are longer than its arms, and they're usually hidden, um, but they use them to capture prey. Squid, um, uh, some can change color. Some are um, used by lot. luminescence. Hmm? Not sure. Um, and uh, squid shoot ink um, to in the uh, to cloud the water and lose predators. Well, we saw it at least twice today. We did. We saw several of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently we upset some squid. Yeah. Sorry it's always, about that. It's always yeah. It felt kind of bad. Mm -hmm. Oh, and um, squids have three hearts. Wait, they have three hearts? Yes, two branchial hearts and one systemic heart. Branchial hearts pump blood to the gills where oxygen is taken up and then flows to the systemic heart where it is pumped to the rest of the body. Wow. Huh. You three hearts. Mm -hmm. That's pretty wild. I'm really curious how that works. I'll have to go look up more on that later. Yeah. It's crazy. Squids are cool. I actually just clicked on something that says they have three brains as well, but I kind of want to verify that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The squids are pretty cool. They're really think, smart. I think they're cephalopods, right? And they're moths. Yes. So I don't mm -hmm. think they have like a centralized nerve network yet. That includes brains. I might be wrong. I think, no, they have to because they have really, That's they true. have um super large neurons. That's why they're used for studies. Um, squid nervous system. Let's do a Google. Complex wow. brain in the form of a nerve ring encircling the esophagus, enclosed in a cartilaginous, oh, cartilaginous oh, cranium. Oh, that's right. It's toroidal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, so it's not like a, like a, like a brain brain, is it? But yeah, it's like I just think a nerve ring encircling I mean, a. I think it is. I mean, a, a cluster of ra of nerves is pretty much. That's true. My. S slimmest understanding of what our brain is. I'm pretty much a cluster yeah. of nerves. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I I had this, I was, last last year, around this time, I got on a boat with people, and all of a sudden I was like, how, there were some, like, communication issues, and so I was just like, guys, we gotta, we're just, we're just electricity and, and fat, right? Like, that's all a brain is, <laughs> and we're over here trying to communicate with each other, right? Like, that we're gonna have issues, let's just sit down let's try to figure out what we're actually trying to say right it's sometimes like, you have to do that yeah i'm gonna calibrate a little bit mm -hmm, mm -hmm, which so. we're about to do once we hit bottom here <laughs> just <laughs> yeah. in a different way <laughs> yeah. that's a good way of putting it though i hope that i hope that helped resolve things. oh it did absolutely it was just good. all of a sudden we were you know there were a bunch of people trying to do a whole bunch of different things trying mm -hmm. to be efficient and all of a sudden i was like yo we're just we're all we're all just you know cutting across each other we're just doing different things and no one it takes time I can, yeah. yeah. Sometimes you have to actively sit down and just kind of like, just put it on the table too. Mm -hmm. That can usually help. Yeah. So, yeah. Squid are cool. Squid are cool. Daniel and Megan and I saw one uh, right before our Herc launched. What? Yeah, just very briefly. It scooted right up near the hull of the boat and then scooted away. Not dang it. There's a whole bunch of them back in the, yeah. the, in the wire cam. Just yeah, we saw it for a long time. Yeah. Now I'm wondering if that's what the birds have been hunting all day. Yeah. Well, there's also always the malolos that are... This is more birds than I'm used to bird. seeing out here. Oh. So they, they were clearly hunting something. Hmm. So maybe a squid, maybe not. But yeah. I feel like I've always seen several birds around the boat whenever I've been. Yeah, it's it, like also, several, we're several is close normal, to but there the was like a dozen today at least. Well, we're pretty close. What, what does it say? We're 60 miles, 60, 60 miles, miles from um, Kure, Hola, Holaniku. Oh, yeah. Holaniku, yeah. Yeah, Holaniku, so. yeah. yeah they're we probably coming from there. Close. 
That's yeah. for sure. Uh, yeah, not after what happened last year. <laughs> oh. I heard about what happened on 137. <laughs> what happened? Uh -huh. We got, we got uh, probably, I don't know, 4,000, 5,000 birds on the ship. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it, was ship. Fun. <laughs> it, it apparently was not so fun. Oh. No, it was I, I did eat birds bring um, a they certain smell. They were regurgitating squid. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of a lot of ship crew was pretty scared. Yeah, it was funny. The ship's crew couldn't go out onto the social deck oh, or anywhere else. Man. No, you couldn't leave. Yeah, you couldn't yeah. go outside at all. No way. Dang. What's that Hitchcock film? <laughs> the, yeah, the, the birds. The birds. <laughs> the birds. Yeah, they, they were up in the windows the in the hangar. There was, there was like ten birds in the window. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Was that a mapping cruise, or did they actually no. have to do ROV ops or something with with all those birds? They had to try. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> this is pretty close to Palmyra, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we had gotten like in too close to the island. Like, wow. On us. <laughs> oh. It's because you have the lights on in the back deck, and mm -hmm. then you get the squid back there. Yep. And then you get one bird, two birds, and you know, after you get a couple. Then all the other birds say, hey, what's going on over there? And then it's just a chain reaction. Bird pile. <laughs> Literal. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, the pictures are hilarious. You guys have to see those. Apparently yeah, the smell was not. Yeah. No, it was horrible. Uh. And, and, yeah, and the ship was like that for a while. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> and by the time I got on for 138, the crew had done a, an amazing job cleaning up. I wouldn't have ever known, except <laughs> that was what everybody was talking about. <laughs> slow approach here <laughs> yeah it looks like we're starting to pick up a uh, substrate though yeah. in one of the sonars looks like we should be landing right on the little ridge line we want to follow them pretty close to the target though. yeah awesome nice job team. nice navigating thank you <laughs> Kukui and I just started a conversation about um, squid and their, their brains, and I thought other people might be interested as well. So Kukui found out that um, uh, cephalopods do have a small brain, but their nervous system is not like a central nervous system. Um, and the neurons are, cl are clustered in what are called ganglia. And my Google came up with... Um, uh, and and that the ganglia are some of the form are some of the ways that they um, are able to have independent control of the different segments of their bodies. Oh. Okay. Whereas we have sort of a centralized nervous system. Right. So it's very different, but I think it's a probably a, a very different type of, right. but still we'll similar nervous system. Hmm, that makes that's sense. That's cool. Yeah, that is cool. Different distribution networks. Yeah. And I think it's really right. interesting. Really come All right, looks there. like we are oh. approaching bottom. Yep, I am. Nice. So we'll let the uh, we'll let the front row do their thing and uh, get ready. Everything ready to go. So, uh, my controller is not responding. I need to reboot it over here, Robert. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's run and find you real quick. Come up a little bit. Where are you going? Oh. Well, I'll go down. You want to go down? Yeah, you stay there. Okay. I was going to turn around and flip around like that. Uh, well, I'm going to come towards you. So. Okay. Yeah, bud. Yeah, don't, don't yank on me. Cause we're, yeah, no, I can't turn. <laughs> I'm just... This 
is acting like we got a lot of current here. Okay. Oh boy. Um, we'll uh, do what we need to with that. We'll see when I get down there. All right. can't turn around. Hmm. Don't don't try and point at me. No, I'm not. I'm trying to go down with you. Yeah, it's blowing me into the north northeast there pretty strongly. I may have to get the boat to pull out of yeah. off a little bit. Pull it off? Well, Maybe. just to, like, off the slope, because you guys are, like, at the same altitude. Yeah. I can't go anywhere. So if you pull, right. if you pull it off, it's not going to... Meaning, like... I can move it up here towards you. I don't know, yeah. or you can set down. You can, you, you let me know. What if you I do. get to the bottom, maybe it, I can manage the okay. current. 